Welcome to one. This is Mike Gibbs, and I'm the founder and CEO of GoCloud Careers, and I'm excited to be here with you again, as we are Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, completely free to answer your questions so you know how to build the absolute best cloud computing career. Personally, I've been working in technology now for over 25 years, and I've been helping others get their first tech job or get promoted in tech for more than two decades, and I want to help you get cloud hired. I've been doing it forever, and when a student gets cloud hired or even somebody from the YouTube channel gets cloud hired, to me, it makes it all worthwhile, all these wonderful things that I'm doing. Looks like I could probably come a little closer to you so you could see me a little better today. So let me slide forward. And this is really um, great. So we can see you all more better and clearly. I'd like to tell you about some incredible things that we're doing for the community. Completely, completely free. But before I do that, why do I come online three times a week completely for free? For one reason. Just one reason. Because I know the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And I know that if you get the right guidance, you can shave decades off of your career time. I was very fortunate. I had found some mentors in my career. And literally speaking, in a matter of three years, I had been in higher places than people that spent decades in their career. And it came from knowing what to learn, having the right roadmap, and following the instructions from people that were more experienced. Since I've done this for decades, I want to help you get cloud hired. Now, before you do, let's talk about some free things that we have. And please ask your questions in the chat box. Tomorrow night, we're going to have two college professors, two business school professors that speak in MBA programs. And they're going to talk about business acumen, which is a critical cloud architect skill, enterprise architect skill, and it's all free. So please join us tomorrow night. If you're not a subscriber, subscribe, hit the bell, and be notified of it. Now, on Thursday... We have our How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar. And we'll cover the cloud engineer job if you're interested in that as too. Because I want everyone that wants a cloud architect job, a solution architect job, enterprise architect job, cloud engineer job to get it and get it as fast as possible. And I'm going to tell you complete how completely for free. I'll tell you what you need to learn, what needs to be on your resume, and everything that you need to get basically hired, cloud hired. Join us completely free. The link is in the description below. Now, in October, we're going to run a completely free AWS Solution Architect Associate Boot Camp ready for the new curriculum. We've got all the new things. And, of course, we'll make sure you understand it. It will not be one of these boring courses, which is blah, 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 with PowerPoint slides where you can't see the person. We will talk and present for 20 minutes. And guess what? You will basically be able to ask questions for 10 minutes. And, of course, there will be plenty of take-home labs for you to do all free courtesy of GoCloud Careers, because I don't want you to have to take any of those certification courses that are out there. I started this company because I looked at those certification courses. I interviewed a 1,000 people that took those certification courses, and while they could pass an exam, nobody would ever get hired. Nobody would ever get hired. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. I do it completely free because I want you to at least have the skills. And you're not going to learn just the name of the service and how to configure that service. You're going to understand what the services are and how to use them in your architecture or your engineering. Completely free. And then I'm going to do a completely free AWS Advanced Networking. I've been seeing the people that are making courses, and they've never worked in networking in their life. So when you watch it, all you hear is blah, 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 because if you don't know something well enough, you can't explain it simply. And I've been teaching networking for 25 years. I'm one of the original Cisco certified internet experts. I taught engineers and architects at Cisco. Riverstone and many companies throughout the world, and I want to teach you networking. And basically, the, net, the advanced networking, AWS Advanced Networking, is an intro to junior level networking, but it's not what you need to know. I'm going to add what you need to know. We're going to talk about WAN technologies. We're going to talk about switching and some switching concepts, interior gateway protocols, IP address planning. Heck, we're even going to cover BGP because I spent over 10,000 hours on BGP at the beginning of my career, and I love it. So, all completely, completely free. And guess what? If you want to get cloud hired and you really want to get cloud hired, take advantage of our 30% discount, which using coupon code 30 F A L L 30 fall 30 zero Foxtrot Alpha Lima Lima and get cloud hired just like all my students that get cloud hired. So join us. So tell me in the chat box, bring me your questions because I want to help you get cloud hired. Tell me where you're from. I'm in Port St. Lucie, Florida right now, having a great time. It's nice and sunny here. My cat's outside. He's all kinds of happy. Everybody has power here, which is exciting. Our hearts and prayers go out for those that still don't have power, but we're lucky to have people around power. So tell me where you're at and tell me your gold career. 
cloud engineer, cloud architect, solution architect. I came to the side, cloud hire. Chow fam, always wonderful to see you. And I came saying hi, Chow. Yes, boy, I love this. Min Win, happy to be here. Cloud hired, fantastic. My best self. Hello, everybody. Good to see you. Dustin, good for you. Good afternoon. My best self. Mr. Gibbs, first, I want to thank you for everything you have produced to help improve our lives. Then I want to ask, what are the most important things we need to learn to become a cloud architect? Great question, my best self. So let's talk about it. Now, I want to tell you right now that a cloud architect is not a cloud engineer. Cloud engineers are amazing people, and we cloud architects are, need them. So but I just want to make sure that they're very different careers. The cloud architect is a career where, it's my, where we design a solution, present it, and sell it. So the most important things for a cloud architect are actually not the tech itself, but the knowledge of business. Because the job of the cloud architect is to basically transform an organization's business with technology. Now, I've graduated, and by graduate, I mean got hired more architects than you can imagine. And basically, I get somebody hired almost every day of the week. And when you ask the architects what they do, and mind you, I've been an architect for 25 years. We never touch the technology. So the first and most critical skill for the cloud architect is communication skills. Communication skills. Now, this is not a job where certifications are really valuable, and we'll tell you why later. Communication skills. Do you want to know why? The biggest thing we have to do is ask the customer about their business goals, their business pain points, and their business challenges. From that, we can think of how we solve the problem. And after we think about how, the, how we solve the problem, we think about the people, the processes, and the technology necessary to improve that business's performance. But if you can't get the requirements and nobody hands you a piece of paper that says, give me this, it's how well you have questions. Basically, you have no architecture, garbage in, garbage out, and everything falls apart. Most of the time, I've seen architectures fall apart because it was a techie trying to be an architect and they couldn't get the requirements and everything fell apart. So first and foremost, it's going to be communication skills. Now, it's not just the ability to answer questions, it's deep listening skills, but it's also the ability to communicate with engineers management, as well as the executive, which means you need to be what's called CXO relevant. What do you say to the CEO versus what do you say for the CFO versus what do you say to the CIO versus the CTO versus the engineers? And you, they basically all speak a different language. So you've got to be the translator of all those languages. Now, next on the list is executive presence. Because you're going to be a peer with the executives, the C-level executives that you're going to be consulting to, you have to act like one. But let's talk about it. The AWS EC2 instance is a virtual machine. Now, if you say that, you'll be escorted out of the room. Unfortunately, you'll be fired, and your replacement will say thank you. So you need to develop executive presence, for example. An EC2 instance is a virtual machine. The way a virtual machine works is, see, I said the same words, but that's called executive presence. I'm telling you, you need it. We teach all of these skills in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. And learning executive presence would probably cost me, actually, no, it was over $10,000 of training and executive coaches for years. We teach it because it's so critical. You can't get hard without it. Now, once you rise a level above that, let's talk about something else. Next, we're talking about leadership skills because as architects, we're going to build a team of really genius cloud engineers and IM architects and network architects and enterprise architects, well, not network architects, I am architects, security architects, security engineers, DevOps engineers. And if you don't have the leadership skills to manage them, well, let's face it, you can't do the job. Now, sales skills are really critical for the architect because there's a couple of kinds of sales we have to do. We have to sell our solution to the customer, right? But we also need to sell internal management. Please give me these 50 engineers for the next six months. And why do we have to sell it? If I need... $10,000, $200,000 a year people for the next year, that basically could cost the company $2 million of resources, so which could be applied elsewhere. So I have to prove that my deal is more important than somebody else's deal. And on projects I work on, I need 50 plus engineers. We're talking about $10 million of resources that I need just from an architecture. So I have to justify that and sell it. Now, the next is we're going to presentation skills. It's not like an engineer where they care about certifications. 
And even to the engineer, they care more about certifications. But for the architect, the interview involves a presentation 99% of the time. And all those techies that are focused on getting certified now have to present to executives. And that's where it all falls apart. So it's presentation skills. Now, also, if you're going to help a business with digital transformation, what you need to do is be able to look at their business. What's going on with their revenue? What's going on with their expenses? Are there technologies that can mitigate those expenses? What are their goals? And you have to translate that into a technology solution. So there's the business acumen. Now, here's the thing. I've been working in tech for 25 years now. Nobody's ever approached me and said, Mike, I want to buy a billion dollars of tech costs. That's cool. Now, I've sold a billion dollars of tech to a single customer before. Uh, well, it was tech plus services. But here's the thing. I had to build the business case. I had to show that if you buy this billion-dollar solution, guess what you're going to receive? Three billion dollars of business is value. So now we're talking about ROI modeling. And see, we haven't touched the tech, which is why if you focus on engineering, you'll never be hired as an architect. And here's the reason why. We have to focus on digital transformation. Now, what are those critical skills to get next? Well, now we are going to take the stuff from the network and the data center to the cloud, which is nothing more than a network and data center that's been virtualized. It's the same stuff as my mother likes to call her, but she likes the word stuff. I think it's cute. So anyway, so next, what is that stuff? Well, it's the networking things and the data center things. So let's break it down into the network. It's BGP, realistically speaking. And I see Manuel is here. We are thrilled to have Manuel on my video editor here. So it's BGP. To some degree, it's an interior gateway protocol because we're going to be using some IBGP and some EGBGP. And IBGP does not work without an interior gateway protocol like OSPF. So that becomes critical knowledge. Now, next, what else are we talking about? Well, we have to do some IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting, route summarization, and route aggregation because the clouds can't take that many routes. And we have to build the IP address plan for the system. Here's why. We get the IP address plan wrong. The rounding is wrong, and then everything falls apart at scale. So there's that. Now, while we're at it, we're going to be to connecting to the cloud. So we're now talking about wide area networking technologies, such as when to use an SSL-based VPN versus an IPsec-based VPN versus a private line versus an Ethernet over MPLS private line versus software-defined networking and SASE. So you must know all those technologies to know how to connect to the cloud. Now, when we connect to the cloud, it's not exactly a private wire like it used to be. There's some intermediate stops along the way, which means we need to be dealing with VLANs and VLAN tagging and VLAN trunking and spanning tree and rapid spanning tree and port channel and ether channel and link aggregation groups and VLAN tags and VLAN trunking. So that's on the switching side. Then on the, we need to also understand NAT. And this NAT is not just going to the internet. We're going to be dealing with a lot of NAT. One-to-one -one NAT, one-to-many NAT, static NAT, dynamic NAT, and port address translation. And so there's all that that we have to contend with. Then we need to have a good understanding of DNS, DHCP, ARP, proxy ARP, and these are only some of the networking things. Now, I'm going to tell you, we teach all of those. I've just covered at least 15,000 pages of reading so far, not including the business piece. Now, on the data center side, basically, we're going to move that stuff to the data center, and you can't move it if you don't understand it. Now we're dealing with servers and server virtualization, containers and container orchestration, storage area networks, block storage, object storage, and file storage. And look what they cover in that AWS Best Certified Solution Architect Professional. It's so intro to junior level stuff, it's never going to work. So you need real knowledge on these things because you've got to architect them. You're not going to be configuring them as architects. You're going to be architecting them. So then you, there's a storage area network. And then it's load balancers. When do you use a network load balancer, an application load balancer? What happens if you need to use both together and how do you architect that? What about reverse proxies and all those other things? It's that. Containers and container orchestration, obviously, because we're going to have containerized apps instead of just on virtual machine apps. We're going to be using both. Now, next on that list, what are we talking about? So now we're talking about databases, and we can't use those cloud proprietary things like Aurora or DynamoDB. They are amazing databases, but 87% of customers are multi-cloud and 97% want to be. So we have to use open vendor things, which goes against what we're taught in our certification courses, but that's what the customers demand. Now we need to know which business applications can transform a business. When do we use you know, kind of fight communications? What about ERP applications or CRM applications? When do we use them and why? And how does that improve a business? 
Now, next, security. We're not going to secure our systems with something simple like they do teach you in your certification, like AWS WAF. Look, AWS WAF is a fine firewall, but there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not healing. It's not adaptive. So when you get hacked, guess what? You're hacked, which means we're going to be using next generation firewalls. When they start to get hacked, they notice a pattern and they stop it in real time. Kind of like if you try to use your credit card in 10 countries in one day, believe me, um, they'll, they'll shut off your credit card unless you were like me and visited four or five, six countries in day, in which case for work. And only in that would they do it. And I've never gotten actually beyond three countries in a day. And that was because they were real close to each other. And that was miserable. So the point is, is you need to understand these things. Now, what's next on the list? How do you put the pieces and parts together to architect it to solve the problem? So you see, we don't ever touch the tech. And you can't learn configuration. You can't learn architecture by doing. And here's why. Imagine an architect's trying to design a hotel, right? Okay. And we handed him a hammer and a, nail, uh, and a nail and a screwdriver and a saw. And we said, here's how to use tools. Do you think they would know how to, how to uh, design a building? Of course not. And that's why when people get certifications of cloud architecture, it's meaningless because they don't learn anything of value. Now, it's good. The certifications are still good because they can help you get an interview. But you must have these skills to get hired. And I want everybody getting cloud hired. So my best self, I hope I answered your question. Chris, can we get to Dustin Goodfrey as the next question? Because he put something down, and I want to stop him, um, and I want to point him in the right direction. Dustin, you're taking a break for some Security Plus training. Dustin, I recommend you avoid the Security Plus at all costs. Employers outside the military don't respect it. Generally speaking, for my good cloud architects and cloud security, people have to remove that from their, from their resume to get them hired. Now, I know you want to do some offensive security. So realistically speaking, there's two certifications that you should do. One is the CEH master, not the basic CEH, the CEH master. That is all about penetration testing and offensive security. That will be valuable for you. Additionally, Dustin, you could do the OSCP. That's another offensive security certification that's valued by employers. Employers prefer the CEH master and security engineers prefer the OS, I think it's the OSCP. But I don't really care what techies value. I care what the people that are going to hire you are looking for, and they're looking for the CEH master. So, Dustin, I'd advise you to not waste your time on the Security Plus. If you do, realistically speaking, when it comes to getting higher paying good jobs in security, you're going to have to remove that on your resume. So I want you getting hired immediately, and I want you having the best skills. So I recommend you do one of those two things and leave the Security Plus for people that are, that are really looking for uh, more basic entry-level jobs, people that it would work. Because most CompTIA certs are kind of what you would work if you wanted to work in the Best Buy Geek Squad or Help Desk or something like that. So I recommend you take it out. Now, if you desire to work for the U.S. government, they do like that Security Plus, but main employers typically not. So I hope that helps you, Dustin. Ahmed. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. Manuela, I'm so happy you're here. Finally got to watch you guys live. So happy to be here. So Manuela, if you've ever seen my new videos and they actually look really good, that's all Manuela. She's my full-time video editor in Colombia. She's absolutely, absolutely, absolutely amazing. And I am so thrilled to see you here. Manuela, it's wonderful to see you today. Atenga Carl, please, is the cloud architecture significant to... Uh, Necessary to be a cloud architect. Well, if you welcome my video on my channel, you'll see a person named Delroy Bat. Delroy Bat's a fine young man. He could take in some thirty-five thousand dollar boot camp that was supposed to help him level up in tech, and he got a CompTIA Security Plus. Basically, he went on about twenty interviews, and no one had any interest in him, none whatsoever. Now, Delroy was smart, much smarter than the average bear, as they used to say on Yogi Bear. He's a good friend, and he visited me this weekend. So here's what actually happened. So this weekend, for example, uh, so what I did is I retrained Delroy Bat from all the skills that he had. Well, actually, he took a $10,000 boot camp. I was thinking of the, somebody else that took a $35,000 boot camp that, that I had to retrain. So Delroy Bat goes and does this. He comes to me, and I retrain him in security. And I get rid of some of those certifications from his resume, make him stand and strong, and he gets hired in security. And then nine months later, guess what? He's now worked for 10 months, 11 months, I can't remember. He's now working as a cloud security architect for a major managed service provider, a major one. 
He turned down three other jobs along the way. He even recently, he was offered, but he wouldn't do it. Someone wanted to give him a job with a $200,000 base and a 30% bonus, but he didn't even entertain it. He said, no, thank you, because he's working for a great, great company, which he loves. And that was just reaching out to him. And he has zero cloud certification, zero. But what he has is competency, competency, competency. So here's what matters. You must know how to do the job. You must be great at the job. And you must be competent. You have employers don't care about certifications. They care about the following. Can you do the job? Means your technical competency. Can they trust you? You know what you know and know what you don't know so you don't make dangerous mistakes and take systems down. That's really critical to them. What is your attitude? Are you energetic, enthusiastic, or passionate? Or are you going to be out there on TikTok convincing the people why you don't want to work and get the job done for your current employer? They want people that are willing to go above and beyond. And they want people that are emotionally intelligent that bring out the best in others. And that's it. They also want great team players. If you're that, you'll get hired. So realistically speaking, that's what we're looking for as employers. Now, I'm going to tell you it's beneficial for you to get a certification, even though it will never get you hired. Wait. Mike says certifications will never get you hired, except for the Cisco Certified Internet Expert. That will help you get hired. That will get you hard enough on that. But... The certifications won't get you hired, but they will do one thing. They'll get you into an interview, which is great. So now with an interview, you can present your case of why you need to be hired. So I like to look at certifications as the icing on the cake. Where people go wrong is they get certified and think that's enough. That's just icing. Now, I don't eat cakes, but my wife likes to eat cake. I have a lot of friends that eat cake. And they tell me the cake is edible without the icing. But nobody eats the icing unless it's on top of the cake. So that's the thing for you to remember. You need the cake. The cake is your knowledge, your capabilities, your skills. That's what gets you hard. That's the cake. That's the substance. The, the, so the, the, the certification is something you hang up on your wall and you show and impress your friends, but it doesn't impress hiring managers at all. So I've gotten lots of people hired without certification, and I've gotten people hired with certification. We generally recommend a certification profile to help and make it look like you're more ready for the job. But we know there's nothing taught in certifications that are valuable to the cloud architect. So just a piece of paper to hang on the wall. 90% of what you learn in certifications you can't use. And here's what a certification is. The name of a service and how to configure that service. Now, here's the thing at Tango. If we use those names and services in front of our customer, our, our replacements will thank us for the nice job, will be escorted out of the room by security. And here's why. Our customers care that we're neutral we're a person that's looking into their best interest. How do we solve their business problems? And if I use a term like Amazon Simple Storage Solution, I'd be escorted out of the room. Plus, my customer doesn't know what it means. Now, if I tell my customer about object storage, and they say, I've been working with object storage for two decades, I understand that, then it doesn't matter if I'm talking about the object storage in their data center from Dell EMC, or if it's AWS object storage, which is S3, or if it's Microsoft's object storage, which is Blob, or if it's Google's object storage, which is cloud storage, we have to speak plain language to our customers. We can't, we can't use those terms. Now, on our certifications, again, there's so many proprietary things which we can't use because we need better solutions or we need more robust enterprise-wide solutions. And here's the last thing. Certifications teach configuration. Cloud architects don't configure. So, again, easily you can get a job without it. I still recommend you do, but, I, but the certification is just the icing on the cake. You need the cake, cake, and more cake. Up and up. Hey, Mike, what can be the reason AWS systems de deny a resume? I did not even make it to the first round of interviews. Should you resubmit your resume for, again for the same role? Well, that doesn't make sense. So up and up, great question. When I started my career, I followed the, the definition. I did not follow the definition of insanity. The definition of insanity is um, doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different response, kind of like hitting your head against the wall and expecting it not to hurt. I guess at some point we hit our head against the wall enough times we have brain damage and we die and then it stops hurting. But seriously, no, don't do that. The key is why you did not pass. That's the key. Why you did not pass the resume. So was it a skill set thing that was missing? Was it a brand thing that was missing? Was the position not even there because it got pulled? You want to find out as why. 
kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Generally speaking, almost everybody's resume will be auto-rejected. And that still means you can get hired anyway. So look, I generally don't send a thousand resumes out there. When I was in the beginning, I sent five resumes. I got rejected from all five, and I started to do some investigation as to why. I tuned my resume, went on my first interview, and guess what? I was hired for a better job than I had planned. So the key is you've got to find out why. And that's the key. So, But I will tell you recently, companies have been pulling jobs and pushing new jobs, filling up jobs, hiring and not hiring. So there's all kinds of great things. There's still an incredible number of opportunities, but you got to find out why. Ideally, if you're in a place that actually offers some resume guidance, share your resume with them. But realistically speaking, we want the people to come to you. So most of my students, the AWS comes to them. Sometimes AWS managers even reach out to me. And recently they reached out to me and I submitted some resumes. Two were denied immediately and one is interviewing, two are actually interviewing right now. So you're never going to know what it is that makes them want something or not, basically on a resume link. But either it didn't follow a format, it didn't have the search, the search engine optimization, the keywords written in there intelligently. Maybe it had them shoved into a skills section, but it needed to be describing these things. So not really sure, but uh, why they re re responded to yours, because I haven't seen your resume, but I can tell you this right now. You got to find out why. And don't just resubmit until you know why. That's the key. Because otherwise, you'll get the same response. So don't keep burning your chances. Resubmit a different resume. Look, I've got ten, five, at least five resumes. Probably should have 10. I have one as an enterprise architect that's focused on the executive level. I have another one as a healthcare architect. I've got another one as a cloud architect. I've got another one as a cloud network architect. And another one as a pure network architect. Because they're all five jobs. And, I, and you position your strengths and skills differently based upon the exact job. So keep that in the back of your mind. Did you position your resume directly for this job or is it a generic resume? Good question, up and up. Let's go to the next one. If you ask me some questions, please pop them in. I'll answer them. How to start with cloud. Akash, you got to remember this. The cloud is nothing more than a network and a data center. That's it. Now, now what job do you want to do in the cloud? So, Akash, I want you to ask me, ask, ask this, uh, tell me this, and I can help you. And here's the reason why. If you want to be a developer in the cloud, you don't need to do anything. You already know how to do it. It's just which virtual machine and which container and container orchestration are you using. There's nothing to it. If you want to be a cloud engineer, there's a huge learning curve. If you want to be a cloud architect, there's an even bigger learning change. But you can do it all. See, we can do everything. But here's the thing. The cloud is, it's got thousands of different kinds of jobs. because have all the jobs in networking and data centers and many more. So tell me what goal you like. Otherwise, it's like you're basically asking, how do I get started on flying an airplane? And I need to know what is where you your destination. So if you tell me which airplane should I get, which is basically the same thing you're asking me here, I'd say, where do you want to go? You want to go to Bangalore? You want to go to Mumbai? You want to go to uh, Nairobi, Kenya? Do you want to go to Lagos, Nigeria? Do you want to go to Cape Town, South Africa? Do you want to go to Palm Beach, Florida? Do you want to go to New York, New York or London? I need to know the destination. So there are incredible numbers of careers on the cloud. Every tech career that existed before the cloud is there, from penetration testers and security, defensive security engineers, to secure cloud security architects like me, to cloud network architects like me. The key is, what is it you want to do? Tell me that, and I will tell you the path to get there, because they all have different paths. For example, the path of the architect is design, presents, and sells. But a cloud engineer knows Python. A cloud architect doesn't do Python. A cloud engineer knows Terraform and works with infrastructure as cloud. A cloud architect is in front of a boardroom. So if you tell me your goal, I can tell you how to get started. But you can't just get started in cloud because you could literally waste your entire life and never learn the cloud because you'd be focused on too many careers. So tell me exactly what you need to go, and I'll help you get how to get there as fast as possible. Cloud, cloud, Chow says cloud developer. If you want to be a cloud developer, there's not much for you to do. You're already there. Only thing you might want to do is learn some basic cloud concepts like that you'd get in the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate. It's super, super basic. But 
you're not going to be doing anything different than you're already doing. So that at least teaches some of the things on the cloud. You're, in your case, that's one of the cases where you could just do a certification and get to your goals. Because here's why. A developer on the cloud, off the cloud, do exactly, exactly, exactly the same thing. No matter if you're writing code for a web application, you're writing code for a web application. It's no different on the cloud versus off the cloud. Now, when you write for a virtual machine, you could be writing for a Windows system. You could be writing code for a Linux system. Guess what? On the cloud, you've got Windows systems and Linux systems. Or you can be writing microservice applications, which we typically use Docker or Kubernetes, something like that. And guess what? On the cloud, it does the same Docker and Kubernetes. Nothing, nothing, nothing is any different. Nothing is any different. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Same job. Their who had a song that used to say, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. There's nothing for you to transition to. There's really nothing to learn, but it would kind of help you if you pass that basic, simple AWS Certified Solution Microsoft Associate or Professional Exam. Either one of those are very interlevel. And that'll just give you some basic things on the cloud. You could take my completely free boot camp on passing the AWS certification in October. Is it October 12th or October 18th, Chris? October 18th. October 18th, we've got a free boot camp. You can do that free boot camp. That'll teach you more than you need to know for a cloud developer, and you'll be good to go. Great question, Akash. Me popping up last minute with a bad connection. Oh, Ken Sherman, 902. I've got bad connections all the time. We live in Florida. I was changing a power supply on a server yesterday, and it's fun that after 25 years of being an architect, I still remember basic junior-level engineering from 25 years ago. Apparently, with the hurricane, it took out one of the power supplies on one of our OpenStack servers or one of our VMware servers, and had to do it myself because it was in the house this weekend. So good to have you, Ken. And love the cat there, by the way. Farah, cloud hired, and yes, 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 ask us our questions. Akam Desai, you're so excited about the networking trim. Akam, I love teaching networking. Love it, love it, love it. I've been teaching networking forever. Literally speaking, I've been teaching either IP multicast or BGP for as long as I can remember. And I love, love, love teaching networking. And because I've been in it for so long, I can make it all these complex things very simple to understand. Simple and elegant. So at the end of this, people will understand some networking. Far more than they ever would any other way. I'm excited to do it as well. Please share, tell our friends to join us. Chow's in Dallas, Texas, and she says, awesome weather today. I'm happy to see that, Chow. And is that a little cat there or a smiley face? Chow, I think you need a, you need a little cat smiley face, not just a regular smiley face. Chow. Minneapolis will assume cloud security, but want to start with the architecture first. Well, Carl Stango, what's your goal? Do you want to design, present, and sell security solutions, or do you want to build security solutions? Because if you want to build security solutions, don't start with architecture. Start with engineering, because that's your job. Now, if you want to be an architect, start with architecture and don't study the engineering. So, Tango, Carl, what's your goal? Because that's what you need to learn. Architecture is putting pieces and parts together in a synergistic solution where the sum is greater than the whole of its parts. Engineering is the tech piece. So now if you want to be a cloud security architect like me, that's different. Basically, you understand the cloud and you know how to provide security solutions on the cloud. So a cloud security architect will do the following. They'll meet with the customer. They'll ask about their business goals. They'll ask about what assets they're protecting. What's the intellectual property they're protecting? Or they'll find out what their security exposure is. You've got you know, 500,000 people's records. Average cost of a breach is $150 to $250 per person. Based upon an expected value of a hacking attempt based on research, what is that? Quantify that thing. And here's why we have to do that. We're not going to spend a billion dollars to protect photos of my cat Cindy. But we might spend $100 billion to protect the secrets of some trillion dollar invention. So we need to know what it is we're protecting. Now then we need to think about how do you educate our users in cloud security? What about anti-phishing, 
anti-social engineering campaigns, how to write an end-to-end -end security policy to secure the organization, what processes, procedures, technologies, things need to occur. How do we determine who the users are, what they can do and track what they did, that kind of AAA authentication authorization accounting. Now people like to call it IAM, identity and access management. We've, we've come up with euphemisms that sound so good, but they're really unclear. So I still use AAA. Now next, what are we dealing with? Physical security, what do we need? Do we need basically security guards that are sipping coffee? Do we need to hire retired Navy SEALs that are private military contractors to secure our systems? What are the requirements? Now then we need to figure out what our DMZs are gonna look like, for example. What kind of next generation firewalls do we need? What are we doing from a data loss prevention strategy, for example? What are we doing from an event correlation and management perspective? See, these are things that the architect needs to focus on, thank you, Carl. Now, our focus is design it, present it, and sell it, and tune it, and optimize it. Now, if you wanted to do the work like an engineer, you can't do all that stuff. You can maybe do one or two of those things, but you need to focus on them and develop, you know, mild deep depth on them. As opposed to the architects, how do we put the pieces and parts together and then go find those hardcore engineers to implement it? So it's about studying for the right things. I wanted you to get you there, but start with the career you want. Don't try to become an engineer and think it's going to make you an architect because it won't. And don't learn architecture to learn engineering because it won't. Two different jobs. Ritesh, sir, is it certification necessary for getting a job? Not at all. What's necessary is the skills necessary to do the job. Like I get people hired with incredible jobs that have no certifications whatsoever, but they have competency. And I get people that come to me who are already certified and I have to make sure they forget everything that was taught in their certification and then teach them the skills that are actually relevant and accurate for their job, which are usually exact opposite of what's in your certification. Sometimes they're related, sometimes they're not. So it's more a matter of understanding Understanding what your goals are, understanding the critical skills for the job, being great at those critical skills, having the right attitude, the right energy, the right enthusiasm, having the right collaboration and communications experience, having the right leadership skills, sales skills, executive presence, emotional intelligence, because we got to figure out what it is. Now, I'm also going to tell you that engineering jobs do better with certifications than architecture jobs, so I don't know which job you're looking for. I will tell you, for cloud engineers, they can have three or four certifications, and it might be a little bit helpful to their profile. Cloud architects get five certifications, and it lowers their salary because it makes them look like certification junkies as opposed to a digital transformation specialist. So a lot of it's based upon the job you want. And the certifications that you do along the way should be directly related to your job. But you don't need a certification to get hired. I've proved it time and time again. I get people with no experience hired. This year, I've had a waste restaurant person or food server get hired as a cloud architect or AWS, by the way. A college student get hired by AWS. Had a geologist that did geospatial imaging got hired as an architect this year. And I think, but I think he had a cloud practitioner, which is basically a simple certification. I've had a mental health tech get hired by a big bank. I had the most wonderful, amazing student. He graduated high school. He didn't graduate high school. And he, this poor guy spent $35,000 on some boot camp. They got him certified, I think, with a security plus. Yeah, and, and when I interviewed him, he knew nothing about security. So what did I do? I trained him. I pushed him hard. He learned he's the son I always wanted, Daniel. And he kept training and training and training and training and training. And now he's working in one of the world's glo glo largest global banks as a cloud architect. Again, not a tech background. And someone land just selling landscaping equipment that got hired as a cloud solution architect. I had a stay at home mom, someone for the last eight years was a stay at home mom that just got hired by Microsoft. And I've had so many great people get so many great jobs. Nobody's getting hired based on certification. They're getting hired on competency, the right attitude, energy, enthusiasm. Are they, are they charismatic? Can they create rapport with the hiring manager? Does the hiring manager like them? That has a big input because hiring managers hire who they like. So it's kind of all those things, all those things that are necessary. Certifications are not necessary. A certification can help you get an interview, but I get somebody with more than five certifications, I won't even interview them because I know they're wasting their effort and they're so scattered that what happens is when you try to learn the whole ocean 
and there's billions and billions and trillions of gallons of it, you can't drink it all. So you don't get to learn it. But if a marine biologist is focused on the marine biology in Florida, or maybe Palm Beach, Florida, they can become an expert on it. So I need people that can do the job. Certifications don't mean anything to me. The only thing that matters is can you do the job? Do I like you? And will you raise the energy of my team? Or will you, re or do, will you make people negative? Are you negative and reduce the energy of my team? If I need you to go above me on, are you willing to do it? If you are, I need that. Or are you going to come up with an excuse why you can't do the job? Will you work in a team and bring out the best in others? Or will you just be someone that tries to do it on your own? That person I can't hire. But your certifications, I don't care. And most employers that I speak to don't either. Hey, Cash, thanks for the help. You are so welcome. Please do apply for the free boot camp. In your case, as a cloud developer, that's all you need to do. Jim uh, Chisick, Cloud Architects need PMP certification? Of course not. Uh, a PMP or a project manager certification is basically managing projects. We're not project managers, we're architects. Now in the PMP, they don't teach you how to build an ROI model. They don't teach you how to sell a billion dollar solution. Those are skills you need. In any certification, they don't teach you executive presence. They don't teach you executive communication, executive writing, leadership skills, sales skills, emotional intelligence. That, those you need for cloud architecture. Business acumen you need for cloud architecture. The ability to do an ROI model, an RFP, an RFQ, that matters. But no, PMP certification. If you had it, I'd probably remove it from your resume because it'd make you look less focused to be an architect. The more things that you have on your resume that are not architect make you look less of an architect. Who would you want to fly your airplane? Somebody that was a farmer, which I love farmers, by the way. Someone who was a chef for a couple of years. And after that, they became a nurse. And after that, they became a professional baseball player. And now they're an airplane pilot. Or do you want the person that went to the military? They were in the Navy. They flew a fighter jet. Then they went to civilian world, they went to flight school or whatever they needed to to get licensed in the civilian world. And now they're flying your 747, 760 second. Who do you want flying it? The person that's been on everything, all in flight their whole life, or the junior level hobbyist. The more certifications you get, the more you look like that junior level hobbyist and not the expert. And I want experts on my team, not hobbyists on my team. Colin, so good to see you. I so appreciate this. Hashtag Cloud President Mike Gibbs. I love that, Collins. I do so hard to try and get everybody hired. I really appreciate the respect, both on YouTube and in class. Collins, you're amazing. Uh, and you're super cool, calm, and collected. That's why I always like to call you 007 or Bob and James Bob. Come decide. You're focused on cloud network engineering. What are the key skills? To master before you can become a cloud network engineer. Networking a com, networking a com. So make sure you have a complete understanding of BGP, not how to set it up, but how to design it, set it up, performance to it, adjust your routing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Focus on that. Next, it not just EBGP, IBGP. Get used to the route reflectors and all those other things. Now, next, you're going to understand some interior gateway protocols, which are going to be in today's world, OSPF, and to some degree, intermediate systems, intermediate systems. And after that, make, you're going to need expertise on IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting, route summarization, route aggregation. Now, next, you're going to need to really understand switching, not at the level that I talked about for others. You're going to have to get deep, deep, deep into VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking, spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, and at minimum, like aggregation groups. Now you're gonna have to become a master at subnetting and supernetting route aggregation, especially in the cloud, because they basically have networks that are about as capable as in the 1999 world. Next, you're gonna have to become an expert on understanding when technologies and configuring them and choosing them and optimize them. That goes into VPN technologies, both SSL as well as IPsec, Ethernet over on PLS, um, private lines or private line equivalents, software defined networking and SASE. And you're going to get into the reading thousands of pages about that kind of stuff. So well, that's on the networking side, especially network engineering, because that really gets deep. 
Now, after that I come, you're going to have to be a master with that because you're going to be using that everywhere. Anybody that's using an RFC 1918 private address as specified by the Internet Engineering Task Force, you're going to be dealing with it when companies buy other companies, when uh, you connect to the Internet, when you need to translate things. So there's lots of use cases for one-to-one, -one, not one-to-many, not static, not dynamic, not impact. And now you're going to have to really understand ARP and how those ARP things work and proxy ARP and things like that. Your, and uh, DNS, DHCP. Now, you probably need to know multicast, which means knowledge of pin sparse mode and IGMP. Now, in addition to that, you probably should also get some familiarity out with the multi-protocol BGP, because that's used across domains, especially for this. You're going to have to get pretty good with GRE tunneling and things like that, because a lot of the clouds don't support a lot of the networking things. So you're going to have to create tunnels directly through the cloud. Now, you're going to have to become a master at route fig summarization and certain things. And, and, and you're going to get, do a lot of work with traffic engineering. So what I've given you so far is at least 15 to 20,000 pages of reading to know it. It's a cross between the knowledge of a CCNP and a CCIE. That's just on the networking side. But now you're going to be on the cloud, too. So now you're going to have to also learn all the stuff on the cloud at minimum for cloud network engineering. You're going to have to deal with virtual machines and you're, because you're going to be dealing with virtual routers and virtual firewalls and virtual VPN concentrators. And you're going to be doing a lot of work with VPC peering, whatever their equivalent is on their clouds and the private link services and the pseudo connections and pseudo wires across the cloud, which look a lot like an MPLS pseudo wire or a frame relay link or an ATM link or a VPLS link, so you know you need to understand that in depth. Now, networking is a lot harder than the cloud, so they're there. Now, because you're going to be in engineering, there's going to be times where you're going to have to spin up a 1,000 virtual routers to do a test. So that means you're going to have to have some good infrastructure as code skills with Terraform. Now, next, routers, for the most part, you know, we get in there, we can fake T, we go to the command line. So because of that stuff, we typically write a lot of bash shell scripts in Linux and Python scripting to Linux is to push configurations to an API versus manually configuring. So those are kind of those skills that are really there for a cloud network engineer. But still here, you really should have some solid communication system skills at Kai. And here's why. This stuff gets complicated in networking. It's not simple stuff like the cloud, especially when you're dealing with route filtering and traffic engineering. And you got to make sure that you don't make mistakes. And mistakes occur when there's poor communication skills. So those are the kind of things you need to focus on. It's a great job. I loved it. I did lots of network engineering, which is now a cloud in network engineering. But I got to tell you, for me to get entry level, I read 75, 5,000 pages. And it come, that's what it took me to do my CCI, which to me is entry level networking. And here's why I like to call it entry level networking. After the CCIE, the CCIE was really about mastering your fundamentals. It sounds complicated, but it was all about how strong your fundamentals were. If you had strong fundamentals, you can solve any problem they give you. If you didn't have strong fundamentals because you were learning 30 people's careers, you'd never pass the exam because you wouldn't have the depth and the fundamentals to know what to solve. So there's that. Just keep that in the back of your mind. And then after the CCIE, it was like, oh, Mike, you're a CCIE. Let me put you on this project. That's where the true learning begins. So I will tell you that my Cisco certified internet expert to me was an intro to networking. And after that, I spent the next 20 plus years learning networking. And it was the time of my life. I love it. So I come to say, welcome to the networking world. You will love it, love it, love it. But put forth the effort. Learn the networking things. Read the documents from Juniper and Cisco, the Internet Engineering Task Force, RFCs, the things from the IEEE, the specs themselves, as well as the cloud providers, as well as WAN providers like Aviatrix and Versa Network as well as all that stuff. Go do it at com. It's going to be wonderful. Igor, what do you think about the CCNA certificate? We need only the knowledge about networking data cloud certificates. I don't completely understand your question, Igor. What do I think about the CCNA? I think it's a good intro to an intro to junior level networking. I think it's excellent. And the CCNA combined with other networking knowledge is very helpful in cloud, as I say, a cloud architect. But you need more than that. So that's why we do the CCNA. 
And we teach that completely free. It's on our YouTube channel. Subscribe and watch the results you like. But then get the other stuff. Attend our subnetting workshops. Attend our BGP workshops. And learn, learn, learn more. Everything they teach you in that CCNA, try to get 10 times deeper than that. And that's the kind of knowledge we're talking about. Now, the CCNA is a nice certification to help get an interview. But it's the knowledge that matters. You can always get hired without a certification. Without a certification. Always. Always. But it really is, is a matter of, uh, what do you call it? It's a matter of having the right skills when you go on that interview. Because, look, we can get you an interview. My average student has 10, 15 people a week reaching out to them to interview them. That's never the problem is getting the world to come to you. If you build the right brand, if you build the LinkedIn resume profile right, if you change your LinkedIn profile to show the things that are relevant to the job as well as somebody else's, if in your LinkedIn profile is translating your past job to your new job as if you have experience by using the right terminology, and if you have somebody that can help you with brand positioning like we do with our Cloud Architect Career Development Program, then you know you can get it with or without certification. But it's the knowledge, Igor. It's about the knowledge. And it's about getting that interview and having a strategy to get that in. But it's about the knowledge, never the certification. And look at, like, like I said, Delroy had no certifications and he got multiple cloud security architect jobs. But what he had was competency. In fact, he came visit me in Florida, and all he could ask was ways to improve his executive presence and his leadership skills. And he said, oh, my God, I've been an architect yet. It's all business. Like all my students say when they get out, it's all business. Meetings, presentations, sales meetings, dinners, drinks, entertaining clients. That's the job. Design, transform, design, present, and sell. We don't touch the tech. So at least that's for architects. Now engineers touch the tech. So it's really about what job you're doing and having the right depth and knowledge for that job. That's what it takes. But you can get hired without a certificate, that's nothing. But you can get hired with certificates too. It's the knowledge that you have. See, I actually hired several people this year. In fact, my chief operating officer, who's on the under the end of the call, here's a, to prove a point, came to me, he did a two month internship. He was so good in his second week of the internship third week that I said, when this internship's over, I'm gonna hire you. And before his internship even finished, I hired him. I never asked Chris to see his resume. I never asked what certifications he has. Here's why. I didn't care. He was amazing. And Chris helped me every day in ways that I can't even imagine because he's an incredible chief operating officer. I didn't even look at his resume because it's irrelevant to me. You can have a, I cared, could he do the job? And I already knew that he could do the job. So why would I waste his time and my time with an interview process even? He was already doing it. And that's the key. Competency always wins, always wins. And you can't hide incompetency with certifications. In fact, Alonzo and I from my team just made a video what it's like interviewing a TEDx interview with a certified person versus interviewing someone that you can hire. It, it'll look like comedy, but it's the reality. I've done thousands of these interviews. I know, I'm telling you. Get the skills, Igor, and you'll be great. Ask us your questions in the chat box. What's the difference between the Cloud Architect pr Career Program and the Tech Accelerator Program? Well, let me put it this way. The Cloud Architect Career Development Program makes you a Cloud Architect and gets you a and helps you get a Cloud Architect job. The Tech Career Accelerator Program is for an engineer that wants to be an engineering manager, a Cloud Architect that wants to become a distinguished Cloud Architect, for example, or a Principal Architect, or someone that's looking into move into management or leadership roles. So I think our programs are named pretty easy. Want to be a cloud architect? Get the Cloud Architect Career Development Program. Want to become a cloud engineer? Take the Cloud Engineer Program. Want to accelerate your career that you already have? Take the Tech Career Accelerator Program. But Pepe, you know what? If it's that hard to understand, and you're not the first person that's asked this question before, maybe we need better names or better descriptions. I think you'll see some secret things coming out soon that'll make it more clear. Thank you. Thank you for asking the question because we want to help you get to your goals. If you don't have a tech background, you want the Cloud Architect Career Development Program. When you've got a $180,000 Cloud Architect job and you want to know how to get a $400,000 Cloud Architect job, well, that Tech Career Accelerator Program will teach you those high-value skills that will help you get the most elite roles. That's the difference. One gets you the job. 
and one basically helps you get promoted in the job. But great, great questions, Puppy. Dara does design. That's neat. Hi, sorry you joined late. You're a UX designer and want to become a cloud architect. How do you map out the subjects and certs you need before the AWS certification? Well, there's two ways you can do it, realistically speaking. You could take our Cloud Architect Career Development Program, or you can learn the following things. Now, the reason I made the Cloud Architect Career Development Program is as follows. The skills that an architect really needs are very, very, very expensive to learn. My education to do this was about a quarter of a million dollars. I didn't pay for it all. I got some scholarships, thankfully. My employers paid for a lot of it. But these are the things that you need to understand. You need to have the kind of level of business acumen that a, someone with a master's in business administration has. And then you need to know the networking and data center thing. So let's talk about what they are. Now, what you need to learn is the following. You need to be able to, have, to, be able to hold a conversation with a CXO level executive, meaning the CEO, the CFO, the CTO, the CIO of a trillion dollar company like Apple, because as architects, we're going to be dealing with big architects, big companies and their executives constantly, constantly, constantly. So you need to be able to talk to the CEO of a big bank, the CEO of an organization that has 30, 40, 50,000 people in it and be relevant to them. Same thing for the chief financial officer, the chief information officer, chief, chief technology officer, and they all speak different languages saying you need to do that. That's called CXO relevancy. Now you're going to need business acumen. And what is business acumen? Business acumen is knowledge of business. So when you're going to consult with a company that wants to increase their revenue by 4% or decrease their operational expenditures by 10%, first you need to know what that is. And then you need to quantify the problem that they have. And if you find a $100 million problem, which you will with a big company easily, and your tech solution only costs $30 million to mitigate that $100 million problem, that's architecture. So you can't do that if you don't understand business, if you don't understand financials, how to read a balance sheet, a financial statement, how to look at what's going on in the business, how to do process modeling and process engineering. And that's why I say, you know, we teach these things, but you could get that from an MBA program if you choose to go that route. I, I've, done, I've learned them from executive courses and an MBA program. Keep that in the back of your mind. Now, next, we're going to be selling constantly. And we don't sell by, oh, imagine this new car, how good you're going to feel in it. It's more about building a business case and showing the customer the value they'll receive to their business. And it's more about responding to requests for information, requests for proposal, requests by quotes, RFIs, RFPs, RFQs. It's all about writing thought leadership documents to help your company sell, sell solutions. It's about presenting at large conferences of thousands of people. No matter where you're at or where you live in the world, you'll be presenting to large numbers of people. And, you know, so it's having those executive communication skills going to keep that in the back of your mind. And then you're going to be having to get people from your company. So you're going to have to sell your management to give you 50 employees to help work with you on an architecture. Now you're going to develop executive presence, which is the ability to be carried out. I'll, I'll, I'll turn off my executive presence. A cloud architect is a person who designs, presents, and sells. I'll turn it back on. You need to be a cloud architect, an expert on designing, presenting, and selling solutions. So there's that. So you've got to get some special training. I've had over $10,000 of training in just that. And I have an executive coach that worked with me on it for years. That's how important that is. Now, those are the kind of things that you need to understand from the business piece. Business piece. Now, on the technology piece, we don't touch the tech as architects. We design it. So we need to focus on what are those technologies and what are they? Well, they are networking and data center technologies because why? The cloud is just a networking data center no matter what we call it. And I have all my students build their own cloud from scratch. And that way they could build any cloud like AWS or Azure or Google from scratch. Not, not the user environment, the whole cloud because I want my students to be seen, to be known, and to be the best in the world. And they are, and that's why they get hired constantly. So the next thing is that you need to learn networking things, such as BGP, such as IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting, route aggregation. 
traffic engineering. It's things like our IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting, switching, VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking protocols, anti-loop protocols such as spanning tree and rapid spanning tree, uh, link aggregation groups, and more. It's understanding network address translation and how do you translate an address to go to the internet and what's the right kind? How do you translate an address for a server where it needs to be static? How do you translate addresses when one company buys another company? So there's not DNS, DHCP, ARP, proxy, ARP, those kind of things. And of course, WAN technologies, knowing how to design and select the right one, whether that be an SSL VPN, IPsec VPN, Ethernet over MPLS private line to remote place or a private line equivalent like express route or direct connect or direct connection or direct interconnect based on which cloud provider you're using or you're going to use a software to find networking optimized WAN or a SASE environment and then it's your servers and your uh, no, we're still actually talking we're still talking about networking uh, so and those are most of your networking things that you need to know now what we talked about is about 10 15 thousand pages of reading or you could take my course and that's all covered here now, on the data center side, you need to have a good understanding of servers and server virtualization. And look, you could take our course and we teach that, or you could go to KVM, QEMU, Citrix Zen, VMware, read it 800 pages or something, and then you'll understand server virtualization. Do the same thing for containers, orchestra containers and container orchestration. We teach it, but if you're not with us, go to Kubernetes, go to Docker, go to OpenShift, and learn all these magical things because you're going to be working with a lot of containers. Storage area networks. Go learn about block storage, object storage, file storage. IBM can help you out, learn a lot of this. Uh, Dell EMC makes these systems. You can learn a lot, or you can take our course and get there. Now, next we're talking about databases. Now we're gonna be multi-cloud, right? Because most everybody is multi-cloud because a single cloud is a single point of failure. And this point, 87% of customers are on two or more clouds. So we need to know what kind of databases work, which open source databases can we use on which cloud? When do we use and how do we use, for example? For example, if we need a NoSQL database because of scalability or schema flexibility, and we know our write traffic is greater than our read traffic, that points us to a direction of certain kinds of databases. Versus if our read traffic was greater than our write traffic, we need to know how to architect that in a multi-cloud environment. Then we need to know about load balancers. Application load balancers, network load balancers, reverse proxies, those kind of things because we deal with in a lot of places. Then security things and security protocols, next generation firewalls, IDS IPS systems, VPN concentrators, and uh, data loss prevention, a little bit about security and event correlation, like what happens going on with your logs. Now, then we need to know the equivalent cloud services for that. And that's nothing, Dara. Once you know this underlying, you know, 25, 30,000 pages of material, or you could just take our course, but whatever case, I just want you to get hired, so I'm giving you the depth, telling you exactly what to learn. Then you need to know how to put all the pieces together. And that's where you need architecture training. Now, that's not covered in certifications. It's how do you put all those concepts out there? That's what we're talking about with regards to architecture training. Now, there's that. And if you get that, then you can get all these things. So it's not about mapping it out. Look, you can pass that AWS certification in three days if you know this material. That's what you need to map out. And it's not certs. It's knowledge. You can have all the certifications in the world. I see it every day. I can't hire that. In fact, when somebody's so focused on certifications, what do I know? They're a certification junkie. They're focused on learning all the superficial nonsense, not the depth to be able to do the job. That's what you need to learn, Dara. And it's a wonderful career, and I strongly encourage you to learn it, either with us or read materials, documentation straight from the manufacturer's sources in the Internet Engineering Task Force. But that's what it's going to take, and you'll do great. Thanks so much for answering your question. You've already signed up from our free architect book book. Looking forward to it. Guess what? We're actually going to be releasing a new book soon, too. Sign up for the free AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate and Professional book. It'll explain what those services are. So when you know those underlying things that I talk about, then you'll be able to translate into the cloud stuff. It's completely free. You can sign up for the uh, pre-launch of the book now, and guess what? When it's completely available, you can have access to that too. They'll be emailed as soon as it's available and it's coming soon. Chris or Chow, if you can pop the link to that in the chat box or the description below. Pepe, if the cloud architect program is 16 weeks, how many hours per day should be spent on it? 
Could we do it in hours to lower the time to say 12 weeks? Pepe, I'm going to be fair and reasonable. Um, what we're talking about is you realistically speaking are probably going to need more than 16 weeks. When we started it, I was able to do this in 16 weeks because it was me and just a small number of students. But reality was, even when we said that, we said for people with a background in tech, we could do it in 16 weeks and about eight months for someone outside of tech. Now, Pepe, I have gotten, I've gotten people through my program faster. I got a uh, Richard a food car hired by AWS inside of three weeks, but that was abnormal. Um, but he did it. I had a Joe Millen, but he was a CCIA like me from Cisco. I got him hired as a senior solution architect with an eight by AWS within the first month. Realistically speaking, depending upon your background, it may or may not be possible in 16 weeks. And it really depends on how hard you're willing to work and how open-minded you are. For example, if you've been in tech for a long time, you're going to be doing different tech things. So how open-minded are you to change your thinking? For example, uh, sometimes they get really great engineers. And they have all the tech piece, except for the architecture piece. But they're so busy trying to engineer that it takes them six months to unlearn the engineering to think like an architect. And in those environments, guess what? It could take a little longer. But sometimes it can take a little shorter. I would say that about eight months is reasonable if you put in about 15 hours a week into the program. I would say that if you put 25 hours a week into the program, you could probably do it in about six months, five months. But Pepe, you're going to do great. You'll learn so much because you can go back and even watch our last 100 classes that we taught. We keep everything so the program gets better and stronger at every time. But I'd like to say that, you know, eight months is about normal. But you have to realize this. Eight months is so fast. Why do I say it's so fast? See, I went to school to practice internal medicine. I'm a nurse practitioner. I went to school for seven years for that. And it was $100,000 of education. I'm getting people a job into, that right now pays $140,000, $150,000. I'm getting students jobs that are paying over $200,000 a year. Not averages between one hundred twenty. dollars and 287, that was our spread this year. I'd say average is about 160, meaning I'm getting people through school of this, and through, through programs that pay them as much as a lawyer or a doctor, literally speaking, in eight months. So there's a lot to learn. And that's why we have live classes three times per week. We have homework assignments with people do in between classes, and we give them feedback on it. There's branding work on their resume. We have to teach sales, negotiation skills, business acumen, leadership skills. And uh, that's realistically what it takes. So you can do it, Pepe 717. I would love to work with you. I'd be honored to work with you. And I can't wait until you're like all my other students and say, guess what might come cut hard because we all celebrate it like a party. But I don't want to promise that you can do it in 12 weeks. I don't want to promise that you can do it in 16 weeks. I let my students stay in the program for a full year. And why a full year? Nobody needs a year. Because I want to know that anyone that wants to get hard has the opportunity to get hard. And I'll keep them in the program for a full year if I need to. And I've done it before. And because my students get hired and we all learn at our own time. Look, you could be someone that memorizes it all, learns it all quickly. It might take you a little longer. I don't care. Same price, same program. I care about one thing. Are you hired? Really, one thing. Are you hired? That's it. So love to work with you. Love to change your career. Love to change your life and love to get you caught hired. Peru, how about cloud consulting? You don't see fancy being an employee your age. How could we proceed? Well, Farouk, here's a choice. I don't recommend cloud consulting for new people for the following reasons. What experience do you have to offer your clients? How do you justify charging three or four or five hundred dollars an hour if you've never had any big experience? So first, there's that. Now, secondly, if you've not been a cloud architect before. Who are you going to sell your stuff to, your services to? What do I mean by that? So I've spent a lifetime designing internet service providers' networks, banks' networks, hospitals' networks. You know, after that, I know who to talk to and thousands of companies to basically say, I can help you, and by the way, I have consulting services. But if you don't have a background 
and you don't have the proverbial Rolodex or that contact list, how do you sell yourself as a one person? Well, what are you going to do? You're going you're gonna to start a beautiful audience, build a beautiful audio office, and spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on that, and spend half a million dollars on branding to get everybody to know your name. And even still, where's your credibility going to be? Because you haven't met anybody or known anybody yet. So again, it's going to be a tough sell. So you could do that, but understand what you're going to have to invest in it. Or you could work as a cloud architect for two years or so. Let them even further train you, put you on the biggest projects in the world. Now when you're after that, you'll have the contact list of the people that can deploy the networks. And you'll be able to have the contact list for the 40 or 50 people together that can design solutions, deploy solutions, and truly make that customer successful. So I don't recommend anybody start cloud consulting until they've actually done the job. And consultant's supposed to be an expert, right? How do you consult on things that you're not an expert in? So I don't know. But my recommendation is as follows. Don't try to do cloud consulting until you've actually had some experience because it's going to cost you too much to try and find people. And I don't, I don't know that age has anything to do with it. Recent, two weeks ago, I had a 63-year-old and a 61-person hired, and they're loving it. They're going to learn on the job. I mean, we train them to get hired. They're going to learn a lot more of their skills in the job. They'll be partnered and peered with people. And a year or two later, wow, look at the consulting they can do because they've got that Rolodex. We need that Rolodex. Otherwise, who are you going to call and say, it's Mike, I'm selling services. Now, if you have a 30-year tech background, Farouk, and you've got these contacts, then yeah, sure, it would be fine. I just don't can't remember your background, so kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And these jobs are very good to be employees at. They pay a lot. They're very easy compared to other jobs. And uh, I will tell you this. I've been an employee, and I've been a business owner. And I'll tell you, when you're a business owner, you work twice as hard for not necessarily more money. Why do people do it like me? I want to help the world. And you know, because it's me, I can charge the least amount possible to run my course. I don't have somebody trying to tell me about profitability. I get students hired all the time, which is my dream, my retirement dream. So, you know, think about that. Think about what it is to truly run your business. It's not as easy as it looks. I can tell you that right now. But if you want to do it, I recommend it. Just get some experience first, and it'll be a wonderful experience. Hiring, getting the people, and negotiating contracts. I can recommend it. I really do. Just get some experience first. Bro. I want to be an AWS machine learning project manager. What should be your path? Become a project manager. What you're project managing is pretty much irrelevant. Become a project manager and learn tech. Now, I wouldn't ever recommend focusing on any vendor's machine learning solution. I'd recommend, if you want to do that, become a data scientist. Because guess what? Half of them, these things are going to be done in AWS. A lot's going to be done on Google. A lot's going to be done on Azure. Some's going to be done in the data center. You know, it might be cheaper for an organization to contact NVIDIA and buy a $100,000 GPU server than pay $100,000 a month on the cloud for the equivalent server capacity. So, you know, you can keep think about that. And sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. Is it running four and four hours a day? Does the organization have the data scientists that are going to write their own custom code? Or is it cheaper just to use pre-made cloud-based code and libraries, which take less development time and then pay a lot more for the service? It's up to the organization. It's what their use case is and what their patterns are. And unless you can focus on the business things, then I wouldn't do that. Now, what should be your best path? Learn project management. And an MBA wouldn't hurt you along the way either. A lot of good project managers have MBAs. Not all don't, but at minimum, get a business degree and then uh, learn project management. But don't focus so much on the, on the MLS, machine learning part. Focus on being a great project manager. I've got great project managers that worked on networking one day that are doing the cloud the next day. They're doing machine learning that are doing something else the next time. Focus on being a wonderful project manager. Focus on your leadership skills because people you're going to get can get people to work that don't work for you. Focus on your emotional intelligence. Focus on selling people into doing their job. Focus on your organizational skills, your communication skill, so you get the right information. You can give people clear instructions. Focus on that. Not the not the AWS piece. 
and you'll be horrible. Focus on the AWS piece, you'll be lost on all on the 80% of the stuff that's not, or 90% of the stuff that's not your job, and you're not going to know how to do your job. So focus on being a great project manager. And then after that, you can learn some AWS. It won't hurt. It's just make sure you learn the technology because that way it doesn't matter which cloud you're on, which is the cloud. It's a trend because where are people do, where would most businesses do their machine learning? You got to look at it this way. Who's the best data company in the world? Google, right? They run the number one search engine and the number two search engine. So where do you think a lot of these machine learning projects are going to be done? The Google cloud. Look, AWS has some good machine learning things. Azure does too. But where's the business going to go? Now, you need the biggest infrastructure. Google doesn't have these big 128-core plus servers. But AWS and Azure do. So it's that, but pretty much the same thing. But focus on maybe machine learning, learn a little bit about that. And then focus on being the world's greatest project manager. And then you're going to be good to go. But don't focus on any vendor specifically. This is not a job like that. Yvonne, you're welcome. Asayas, hey, Mike and team, looking forward to joining the Cloud Architect program and becoming a great architect. Asayas, we're excited to be working with you. I think I saw a registration come in from you earlier today. My team is basically going to enroll you into the program because of the way you came in, and we're excited to work with you in every way. Your question is, how is important to sales skills as a Cloud Architect? Critical. Not possible having the job without it. Do you have any book course recommendation in sales? Yes, come to class. Follow the course exactly as designed, and you'll be building your sales skills. Every day, we design, present, and sell solutions. If you don't have the certs, employers skip your CV. That's not true. And how do you justify to employers what you know and how you know? You said competency, but how do I emphasize that? Well, I got your resume, right? And I got your LinkedIn profile. I get people... 15 interviews at a time, and they've never had a single cert. So the question is, what is your brand? What does your brand say about you? Do you look like a jack of all trades? What's on your resume? Does it match the actual skills for a job? And here's what I mean. If you had designed and deployed an OpenStack cloud for enterprise-wide computing, and many of my students have that because they all build an OpenStack cloud. Now, if they said designed and deployed OpenStack for cloud computing, now it's getting even more questionable because it doesn't something doesn't match. And if they design, designed an OpenStack cloud for AWS computing, then again, it's there. And I got to tell you, 90% of the time when I look at a resume, it's clear the person doesn't know what they don't know, know or don't know. Now, the next, there's usually spelling, grammar, and language issues. Then there's typically readability problems on the resume. A resume has to pass the smell test. Here's what the smell test is. Me, the hiring manager, if I can look at it within one quarter of a second and figure out what you are and what you can do for me, I care. So most people, what do they do? <coughs> they have this, their name in small letters, and then they got this abusified skill set in which lists everything in the world. And guess what? That resume is trash. I'm not even going to look at it. Now, let's say you've got my resume. What I'm going to do at the top? If I have certs or not certs, mine will say Mike Gibbs, MS, comment, MBA. Then I typically put CCIE, and occasionally I list the cloud cert, usually a Google Professional Cloud Architect. But I don't even list, don't always list the certs. If I list certifications, in many cases, it lowers the offers I would get from someone. So I want them to see me as me, the enterprise executive, not the techie. But then what, then what do most people have on their resume? They have an objective. An objective makes me trash the resume in the first two seconds. Here's why. An objective on their resume basically says, here's what I want from you. Hmm. Last time I hired somebody, if the first thing they said is, here's what I want from you, I'd politely escort them and have security escort them out of the room. Because I need them to do something. I'm not worried about what their demands are. So talk about that. Now next, what's in there? And how does it pertain? Is the right language for the job? Meaning, if you wanted to be a cloud architect, which is a digital transformation specialist, and you said, coded a website in Java, I'd look at it and it would be trash because architects don't code. Now, if you say on your resume, designed new, applica new sales application with Java that increased sales performance by 
Now you're speaking architect language. So is the language match the career and the specialization? Now, what's the story of each job? Is it positioned in terms that the employer needs for the new job? For example, I used to practice internal medicine. Some people would say that's completely unrelated to architecture. I showed the hiring manager why my medical background made me a great hiring manager. And he said, what do you mean? I changed what was on my resume to be said. So here's what a doctor does. Patient comes to the office. Now they're called clients, by the way. So a client comes to the office. They have a chief complaint. My throat hurts. What's the doctor do? Ask some questions. Hey, what makes it better? What makes it worse? What do we do next? We do an, we do an uh, what do you call it? We do an examination. Look at your lymph nodes, your eyes, your ears, and your nose, your throat. Listen to your hearts and lungs. Then we make a diagnosis. And then we will do the treatment plan, which is usually a prescription. What's the cloud architect do? They meet with a client. They ask them questions. Then they bring in some engineers to do the examination and evaluate their systems. Then what do they do? They make a diagnosis. And what do they do? They build the plan called an architecture. So doctor interview a patient, architect interview a patient. Doctor, ask some questions. Architect, ask some questions. Doctor, examine the patient. Architect, bring in some engineers to examine the patient. Doctor, diagnose. Architect, diagnose. Our doctor, make a plan. Architect, make a plan. It's the same job. So what you're showing your hiring manager that the old job is new experience for your new job. This is kind of a place to fo focus on that. So focus on that next. Now, after that, do everything you do align with it? Do you have certifications in other careers? Remove them. On your other careers, make sure that it's there, but make sure in depth. And it's got to be in good depth. You literally show how your skills are related. I do this with our students as part of our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. If you don't have someone like me, you, don't, you can't ask a resume person to do it. Why? Because they don't know your career. Find yourself an executive coach. And this executive coach needs to have the following background. They need to have been in the job about five to 10 years. They also need to have some executive communication experience, coaching experience, and training experience. Let that person come in and evaluate your resume and tune your resume with you in terms that they would want if they saw that they were the hiring manager. That's what I do with my students. I help them put all the things that are necessary in the resume, re-justify them, rebrand them so what people know exactly who they are by their resume. And then on the interview, it's all about how do you present it. So what's your brand? Do you have blogs out there? Have you, do you have a name out there? What kind of posting you've been posting on, on, on LinkedIn? Does it show you as an expert? My students respond to my post and get interview requests just from that. But my, my students all have special brands. And we've helped all our students with our brands. And once every month we're, we do it. In fact, in uh, this Friday's class, I'm going to be taking two of my students' resumes. They're both going to be teachers. And we're going to be training them the cloud architect resumes. And because they've got so much valuable experience, but it needs to be repositioned in the manner that the hiring manager can do it. And either one of them could be a cloud architect and work on my business any day of the week. That's so great. But you got to have the right skills. you got to know the job completely. And then after you know all this, then you'll be good to go. So there's lots of reasons people skip your CV, and it's not usually search. Stephen, is it really possible for a non-tech person to get a job in the cloud? Of course. You got the cloud practitioner alone. That's not enough. There's no certification, Stephen, that's enough to get you there. What certification do you recommend for a mid-tiers test engineer? I don't recommend a certification. I recommend you come in expert at the job. Look, I've interviewed 1,000 AWS certified people, and at least 300 of them had the AWS certified solution architect professional. None of them were hireable for any job because the certification teaches you the name of a service and how to configure that service. And unfortunately, that's not anybody's job other than maybe a cloud admin. And even that job more required needs more knowledge than what's in the certified solution architect professional. So, Stephen, could you tell me what you want? And then I can tell you how to get there. Now, Stephen, this year, I got a waiter hired by AWS. I had a college student hired by AWS. They didn't have a tech background. I had a geologist get hired by AWS, no tech background. I had a landscaper get hired by one of the, uh, one of the cloud providers. I had a mental health technician uh, get hired 
at a major bank. I had a high school dropout that was selling shoes at Nordstrom, get hired by a major bank. I had a stay-at-home mom, get hired by Microsoft as a cloud solution architect. I had another person get hired by Apple this year. And I had plenty of people that had no tech background that got hired as cloud architects. It happens every single day in the week. Or not every day of the week for us, but a couple of times per week. It's constant. Here's the thing. It's about being trained. But certifications, unfortunately, are the icing on the cake. You need the actual cake. So, Stephen, if you tell me what career you'd like, then I can tell you what you need to learn. And then which certifications will help you get an interview. But certifications will never, ever, ever get you a job. What do employers and one? It's not certifications. They want to know, can you do the job? They want to know, can they trust you? They want to know, do you know what you know and know what you don't know so you don't make a mistake? Meaning if somebody just has the certified solution architect professional, they don't have an idea what they don't know. And they're going to cause damage and outages, which will cost more than not having the person at all. So then there's that. What is the person's energy, enthusiasm, passion? That gets communicated on your resume too. After the communication of two. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So that's realistically what we're talking about, having the right skills. So tell me the job you want, then we can tell you what the right skills are. Mauricio, how do you justify our lack of experience for all of us with no cloud experience when applying for jobs? Well, the same way I take someone that's never worked in tech in their life. Now, depending upon what you've done, Mauricio, and I, if you've worked in tech, the reality is you've been working on the cloud forever. So, Mauricio, the first cloud that I worked on, for example, was Frame Relay, and that was in 1996. And then in 1998, as a network engineer, I worked, as a, worked on the ATM Cloud, which was another cloud. And there's that. So what is the cloud really? For those of us that have been in tech, if we've worked in a VMware environment, we built our own clouds for the last 20 years. So there's that. But realistically speaking, it's not hard to justify our experience. For students in my program, if you'd be in our program, you will have experience. Because first, we will create an internship for you under the GoCloud Careers brand. Then we will give you real projects. Sure, we'll give you 25 things to do in Azure. Guess what? Nobody cares. Just this way, you can say you've done them. We'll give you 25 things to do in AWS like our competitors would do. Same kind of love. That won't get your heart either, but you can say you did it. But if you're in our program, you will have experience. During these eight, nine months, you'll be working with server virtualization in our data center. You'll be building firewalls, working with real things like that. VPN concentrators, you'll be making containers, for example. You'll be working with Active Directory, which everybody uses, not AWS IAM. It's more of a federation kind of thing. You'll be working with that. You'll be setting up servers the hard way so you know all the stuff that you're migrating. And you're even going to build your cloud. And you're going to have those things that actually count as real experience, plus us on the GoCloud career side. If you're not with us, you can buy a server. It'll cost you about $2,000. It needs to be a Xeon server, relatively recent, minimum of 16 cores, minimum of 128 gigs of RAM, and a minimum of three SSD drives in RAID 0 or an NVMe drive. We have a bunch of them. They're all about $2,000 each. We have like 30 of them sitting around here. Keep that in the back of your mind that our students get to play with. But, you know, there's that. And on that, do those labs. Now, next, make sure you're giving presentations. You're designing them, presenting them, selling them. All my students get that, and they do it under their internships here. Now, for example, Mauricio, this year, we, were, we published an AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional book. Well, it was, it was Christmas. Now we're having a new one. And I make my students co-author many of these books with me, those that want to. And now they're published authors. Now, Mauricio, I have 50 of my students volunteering in a project in Africa to help people learn cloud, cloud computing completely free in sub-Saharan Africa. So that I give the, uh, my students the opportunity to show that they're instructors and even in missions. So they're doing things. Then we help the students tune their resumes we do classes constantly on this, and the students follow along in class so they know what to do. And when they tune their resumes, they show they have experience by, by showing how their old job was related to the new job, which we're experts at doing these things. In fact, this Friday, we're going to be doing two teachers things. But then we also do a lot of branding things. Mauricio, I also write a lot of articles for my students. For example, I've been in over 50 magazines this year. 
I write these articles so people know my students and they're, they literally reach out to my students sometimes just because they're part of Go Cloud Career. In fact, some of the cloud, one of the cloud providers reached, reached out to me a month ago and another cloud provider, another one reached out to me just today just to talk about collaborating in ways because our people are so good. So the point is, is you know, we work hard, consulting firms reach out to us, other organizations, the hub architects reach out to us and they say, who do you have God writing like? I need one of yours. I don't want somebody to pass the cert. I want somebody with expert skills and expert business skills and seed level relevancy. So it's about writing the right resume and it's about working on the right projects. Mauricio, and I think you sent a message earlier to me today um, on, on LinkedIn. Our students do this. We will put you on the projects and you will have experience. Sometimes I even interview my, experience, my students on YouTube if they're exceptional. We work hard to get our students big exposure. And about 75 more of my students are going to be published cloud authors coming soon. I got another book that's, that's, in the, that's written that's in the editing stages for the Google Professional Cloud Architect book as well. And I got another 60 or 70 of my students published. The world knows my students' names because of the branding things we do and the branding things they do. Look, I don't want everybody, we didn't look for people to know my name. But, you know, I do like that social media enables me to educate people across all the world, some for free. Some get extremely additional benefits from joining our paid programs, but I get to connect with people all over the world, and I really, really love that. So there's that. So that's how you do it, Mar Mauricio. You'll do great if you do these things. I come to say thanks so much. You have a clear vision now. I already have some networking skills. Wonderful. McComb, I love networking. It's just fun, fun, fun for me. Min win. Even if it takes a year, it will still be worth it. One year of studying and the course cost a thousand dollars to get a hundred K job. Can't get any other course with a higher return on investments. Win win. That's my thing. Literally speaking, we figured out how cheap could we run the course and still do offer what we do. I mean, we have, we have people grading homework for the students, which they turn in. We've got people working in a data center. I've got three MBAs on staff and a person with a master's degree in economics who teaches economics that works for us. We have business school professors coming in with PhDs in business that have been teaching at schools that are really heavy business-oriented schools that actually talk to my students periodically. So these are the kind of things that we do. So yes, Manwin, thank you so much. For me... We picked that price just because it was about the cheapest we can do it and still deliver a quality product and get students hired. And whenever one of my students calls me and says, I got a $120,000 job or a $180,000 job or a $287,000 job, which one student told me, I'm proud that I was able to meet my mission of providing the world's cheapest effective education to getting people six figure plus jobs, basically the same one to two days pay for our average graduate. That's my dream to change education. I'm pretty, I feel pretty good that we've done it, at least with our students. I want the world higher. I grew up with nothing. Tech and medicine changed everything for me. And when my students get cloud hired, it's just it's the greatest feeling in the world. Thanks, Minwin. Pepe 17, you start the cloud architect program the moment you sign up. We will never do batches for the following reason. The reason I don't do batches is I want all my students hired, right? And a normal program does a 16-week batch. And at the end of the 16-week, the people are kicked out, and who cares what happens to them? I can't do that. So we have no batch because our students get hired while in our program. They don't have to wait to graduate the program to get hired. They get hired inside of our program. We keep them upwards of a year just to make sure they're hired inside of our program. So we do this. So Peg, Pepe, 117, here's what they would do. So we do three live classes per week, which all stand alone. <laughs> Two are architecture-based, and one is based on business skills. So let's say this week we focused on banking architectures, and next week we focused on retail architectures, and the week after that we focused on uh, healthcare architectures, the week after that we came out with provided another one. So each week or, or class we use different architectures, and we cycle through them. So every student, regardless of their start, gets through them at least one to two times. Now next. The program itself is actually self-paced. 
In addition to the live classes, in between classes, there's a lot of work to do. Career planning things to do, Pepe. Projects to do. Presentations to do. So many things that you'll do. And you'll do it on your own pace. Lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. And boy, do we have lessons in this program. A lot. Because I want to know you've got the skills to get hired. So you'll do your work. You'll turn it in. Our team will give you, we'll give you feedback on it. Whether it's presentation skills feedback, technical feedback, resume feedback, whatever it is. Because we want you to get better every day. So that's all self-paced. So the classes rotate so everybody gets to do them multiple times. And then next, the individual part is self-paced. Now, then there's a lab program. Our labs, AWS labs, you know, our labs are the stuff that gets you hired that nobody else is willing to do. Because why? They'd be buying $2,000 servers for their students. Nobody's willing to do this. We are because it's not about money for us. I don't need to work. I just want to get the world cloud hired. That's my mission in life. So then there's that. Now, why do I not worry about batches for classes. Why do I mix the senior, junior, and new people together? Well, when you work in the cloud, for example, that's what life is going to be like. Sometimes I mix my engineers and architects in the same class so they even get to work together because in the real world, that's what it's going to be like. So today, or tomorrow's class, when we do architecture, what will happen is I'll present a solution. The students will help me design the architecture, and then they'll present it back and sell it to me as a role. That's what we try to do in most classes. So if we do this tomorrow in class, like we normally do, the senior students will be the ones that will be helping design the solution. The intermediate students may help them. And the new people will be watching and observing. A couple of weeks later, inside of a program, because we're not like others where you kick you out of a program and we hope you get hired later, then inside of your program, those senior people got hired. The medium people are now the senior people. And those newbies that were watching and observing and learning before, now they're assisting the senior people. And we've got a new set of newbies, and we do that. But the real key for me is I had a student that had to go to Ethiopia for a couple months. We welcomed her back in the program, and she did nicely. I had one student that had to go to Bangalore for six months. I didn't care. We welcomed him back when he came back and got him hired. That's really the key, and that's why we never do batches. We never do batches because we want to know you have the time in our program up to a year to graduate. And if you get through in five months, great. If you get through in two months, great. If you get through in 11 months, great. And if it takes you a year, I don't care as long as you're hired. That's why we don't do batches. I train that way in medicine because you've got people of all backgrounds. And uh, I also train, train that way in martial arts. You don't just have black belts and black belts together. You've got black belts, brown belts, red belts, white belts, all in the same class, all learning from each other. Great question, puppy. Mike, talking about OpenStack design, OpenStack private cloud for enterprise wide computing, how would you explain this in the interview as a cloud architect? Great question. And we'd state, we helped design an OpenStack cloud because we had a fair number of servers that could do the computing power, but we wanted the agility to basically expand and contract on desire. For example, sometimes we might have the web application that would need a lot of capacity, and sometimes it would have capacity left over. And if the capacity was left over, we could use them from dev test projects, for example, by using free compute power or something to that effect. But really talk about the benefits of the cloud, the nimble just and the agility of the cloud. And then we could, we could do cloud bursting and we could take that OpenStack cloud in our organization. And I know you've been setting up some of the network for you, especially OpenStack. And then we could talk about connecting that via VPNs on private lines over to the AWS cloud and or the Azure cloud because you built um, an, a, a, what do you call it, an Active Directory server with that. And I know you, because you did it. You federated the Active Directory server with the OpenStack Cloud. You can talk about you know, federated identity and access management, which you could do in the OpenStack Cloud and across other clouds. So really, that's what you're talking, you're talking about. Why did you build it? Now, if we went with something that wasn't a cloud, for example, and we were just using straight servers, you know, we're, we're moving the servers up and down. We lose that kind of auto-scaling kind of functionality. We have to make our manual servers a specific capacity. And by being a specific capacity, we, don't, we can't leverage that extra capacity for batch jobs or things when we don't need it for otherwise other competing folks. So those would be the kind of things that I would point out up and up.
Igor IKS, I want to know more about cloud native development, how to start. Um, Chow or Chris, can we go back and see what Igor IKS wanted to do first? Because I want to make sure that he doesn't desire to be a cloud architect and, and asking about cloud native development. What were the previous questions? Hi, what do, you, what do you think about the CCNA? It will be helpful to be beneficial in knowledge and networking about cloud certificates. So, Igor, I want to know what you'd like to do. Because if you're asking me about cloud development and you want to be an architect, that's going to keep you from your architecture career. Now, it would be great if you want to be a software engineer. But I, by you're asking me about the CCNA and cloud certificates, now you're asking me about cloud native development, which would not be something you would do as an architect. So please tell me what career you want. And from there, I can go back to this, but I, I can't answer it just as it sounds yes. Because I, I, cloud native development could be anything, software development. It could be just a little bit of Kubernetes and orchestration knowledge. So I don't know what you mean there. Let's go to the next one until we figure out what his goals are. Thank you so much. That was a great way to explain it. Thank you so much, Up and Up. I've been watching you on my YouTube channels for about a year now, and it's been an exciting time. It, and now, Mauricio, I don't know what you mean by crossover cloud architect. Um, the program's suitable for anybody that wants to be a cloud architect in any part of the world. I've gotten people hired right now. I'm going through, a, I'm a writing something for somebody in Tunisia. I've gotten people hired in Australia and New Zealand. I've got people hired, you know, there's people getting jobs that are from South America, people that are getting jobs in, in Asian countries, people that are getting hired in India, people that are getting hired in England, Europe. So it works for any cloud architect anywhere in the world because they all do the same thing. But I don't know what a crossover cloud architect does. No, we get plenty of remote jobs. Rena, after completing the TOG run, what is the time frame most find a job and what are the titles? Rena. Our students either become cloud architects, solution architects, or cloud engineers. They're the only titles. Occasionally, we get people at enterprise architect jobs, but they're even better. They pay far more, and that's okay. And occasionally, we get cloud consultants. It's not after completing the program that they find their jobs. It's while they're in the program. We don't do batches. My goal is not to basically sell a course and hope you get hired later. You buy our course and stay on our program for upwards of two a year until you're hired. That's why we give you a year to get hired. Because it's not when you complete the program with time frames. That's terrible. People that do that, I mean, it's like they just don't care. They just want to suck up your money. Because they're saying, here, I'm willing to charge you X, and hmm, you're not my problem after your 16 weeks. We're not doing that. We're letting them stay in our program, or students can stay in our program. What do they get hired as? Cloud architects, solution architects, and cloud engineers. Why? Because those are the three things we train. Now, occasionally, it's an enterprise architect. Occasionally, it's a cloud consultant. But it's not like people, we have people starting as cloud admins. They get the jobs they train them for. And they do real, real, real good. But no, it's inside of our course. I wouldn't be like that. That's not who we are. Let me go to the next one. Up and up, you find yourself so lucky to be able to work with the more experienced students. They have so much to share and always willing to help. Smiley face, you've learned so much from your friends. I, I, I'm so happy to hear that up and up. That was my whole goal of doing it this way. Same way you train doctors, same way you train martial artists. Experience with the newbies. First, do you cover mindset? Absolutely. We have to cover mindset. We cover how to respond in stress. Last week, we even had a situational awareness training because that's critical. We cover how to control your emotions, how to manage others' emotions, how to lead, how to communicate more effectively. Has to be mindset. If you don't cover mindset, you, you're not. First, you have to build the plan, which we help with. Then we uh, assist in making sure you can, you know, exactly what to do and tune your plan. And then you got to get the right motivation and mindset to get through it. Yeah, we covered that. We definitely cover that. My students had a big mind shift last Friday, I can tell you that. 
And a lot of them thanked me after the class. <clears throat> Chris, let's go to the next one. Stephen has a question about a cloud newbie, and this is a big misconception, so I think we should address it. Stephen, if I were a newbie, which would you recommend, Cloud Engineer Core Development Program or Architect Program? I actually am going to tell you, Stephen, that it's probably easier to become an architect than an engineer, but it's based upon you. So here's the thing. I've gotten people at Cloud Architect jobs with no experience, and we deal with Cloud Engineers. It's not a problem. What's the problem is being capable for the job, so which you find more interesting. Would you like a life where you're traveling, delivering, designing, presenting, and selling things where you don't touch the tech, but you do a lot of business deals, negotiations, lots of dinners? If that's it, take the Cloud Architect Career Development Program. If you want to be a hardcore techie that sits behind the computer all day, codes and configures and builds and super technical smart, as opposed to super business smart, then you want to be a cloud engineer. They're both great jobs. Here's the difference. The Cloud Architect focuses on digital transformation. That is our focus. And the Cloud Engineer focuses on exclusively the tech. So focus on the tech, you're an engineer. Focus on the business, you're an architect. So it's all, do you want to be customer facing, designing, presenting, and selling? You want to be an architect. You want to code and configure and touch the tech all day? You want to be a Cloud Engineer? I don't care which one, which one is more happy to you. We get you your goals, we'll work our best to get you your gold. And as long as you do the work, you should be able to get to either one. So what will make you happier? Architecture careers pay more than engineering careers, but you got to love what you do. And that's what matters most. Good news right now, we've got a 30% sale using coupon code 30, F-A-L-L, 30, Foxtrot, Alpha, Lima, Lima. And it's a good time we can get you started and on the way to your goals, regardless of what they are. But I want you to pick the one that's going to make you most happy. See, do we teach multi-cloud architecture? Of course we do. We would never do a single cloud architecture ever. A single cloud is a single point of failure, and there's almost no good use case for a single cloud. Our students, we teach them how to do multi-cloud every, every single time because we want them to get hired. So, I mean, the main clouds that we teach are the OpenStack cloud, the AWS cloud, and the Azure cloud, but we do work on the Google cloud too. And we cover all the industrial applications that don't from huge cloud. We teach very much multi-cloud architecture because 87% of customers use the more, more than one cloud and 97% want to be. You can't just study AWS and expect the future. You can't just study Microsoft or Google and expect to have a real cloud future. That's why we always go. Stephen, thank you for explanation. You appreciate your answer on questions. That's why I'm here. I'm here for our stuff. I'm here to guide you on your path. I just want to get the world cloud higher. Mauricio, gracias, Mike. De nada, Mauricio. Robux, when you look at AWS Clears, they have two right, a cloud architect and solution architect. We can't go by AWS numbers, and I'll explain why. What are the difference? Well, a solution, so a, cloud, a real cloud architect outside of AWS is someone that designs solutions across multiple clouds. And a solution architect is someone that sells something on one cloud. Now, AWS made up their own term cloud architect, which is really a hybrid between an engineer and a solution architect. So it's kind of like a midway junior role. It's kind of vague. It's kind of like an engineer because they're doing some coding and configuring, but a little bit of technical architecture where a solution architect doesn't get very technical. They focus much more on solving the business problem. So that's AWS. But normally speaking, a solution architect and a cloud architect is the cloud architect works off multiple clouds at the same time. Solution architect, you work for AWS, you sell AWS. You work for Google, you sell Google. You work for Cisco, you sell Cisco. That's kind of things. But AWS called the cloud architect a hybrid role, but that's specific to AWS. Good question, Robux. The ominous you learned about cloud de development and, no and noticed you don't have networking knowledge. Well, that's the key. What do you want to do? Because you want to do cloud development Networking is not what you should focus on. It's development skills. If you want to do architecture, for example, don't focus on cloud development. So that's why we really want to know what you really want. It's not what you started with. What's your goal? I probably, like I said, I studied internal medicine. I went to school for seven years, changed careers. Within six months, I was a senior network engineer, and six months later, I was a lead architect. So you can do whatever you want. I just want to know what you want.
Robus, your friend is a solution architect and he's not doing the Ocotec Archer job. He's not a real solution architect. I'll explain what that is. He's also doing, well, project management. Yeah, we do some of that, but project delivery, no. So what happens, Robux, is there's some engineering jobs where they give architect titles. They're not doing real architecture work and they can't because you can only focus on one thing at the same time. And if you're not focused on digital transformation, you're focused on the tech, what happens is you become a horrible architect and a mediocre engineer because you're kind of all over the place. So there are some of those roles that they don't have them at the companies we typically get our students hired. When our people are Bearing Point, Deloitte, Accenture, JP Morgan Chase, Microsoft, Cisco, um, AWS, or Apple, or any of the places where we have architects working. I think it's Apple. We think they became an architect at Apple. If not, it was some senior management role. I can't remember, not a good management role. I can't remember coming out of the same program. They don't ever touch the technology. Now, there's some mom and pop shops that hire an architect and they don't know what an architect is and they have to do these things. But real solution architects never touch the tech. So it's very common for people to have engineering jobs with architect titles, but they're not doing architecture. And then when they go on a real architect interview, nobody knows what to make of them because they have an architect title, but they don't know architecture because they're so focused on the tech. So you will see that in certain parts of the world, but they're not really architect work and uh, I wouldn't focus on that. I focus on being a great architect or a great engineer based on what you find is more interesting. What is the future of the cloud architect job? I think this has got the best future of all careers right now. And here's the reason. Everything, technology is, is, is a competitive advantage to everything. More things are going on, internet of things devices, more and more and more stuff, more is IP enabled. And uh, the technology, itself is, is easy now. So when, where it used to be, we needed really smart engineers that could just be glued to the technology all day. What do we need now? People, the, the technology now works. Now we need people that know how to put it together better. <clears throat> and the more the economies get in more recessions, the more architects we need. So we need architects to truly figure out and help companies better leverage technology to earn more money. That's not going anywhere. I, the fact, since I started, architecture jobs went from little mini tech, mini architects, which were like hybrid engineers and architects, to full-fledged executives. I know places where you're a VP level, if you're a VP, if you're an architect. I've got some of my students that are VPs as architects. Other students, architects, or directors. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. It's a leadership path, and it's got a lot of path. And you can move up as architects, principal architects, distinguished architects, move into C-level executive management positions like CTO and CIO roles move up the directors of engineering and director of architects. It's got a really good path. You're welcome, Robux. What you meant is road jobs. Yes, cloud architects get remote jobs. I remember a couple of years ago, somebody wanted me to support a client in Japan from Florida. Those time zone changes seem kind of crazy. So I called my best friend in my garage in Bangalore and said, hey, would you like this job? So yes, there are remote jobs. Not everybody company has them, but where you live, Mauricio, it's going to be pretty easy to get a remote job. Pretty easy. In certain parts of the world, it's harder, but it still happens. But Mexico, with NAFTA, you should have a pretty, I wouldn't assume you'd have a hard time with it. Okay, well, I think we've actually reached the limit of the time that I actually have here today. So I'd like to remind you of a few things. If you want to get hired, we have a 30% sale off of all of our programs right now using the coupon code 30FALL. Now, this is the cheapest we can possibly ever go to get you guys cloud hired, and we're offering that discount to help change your lives, increase your income, and give you the career of your dreams. My dream is to get everybody cloud hired that wants so, and that's why we do this and all the work that we do, including these free webinars. Next, please join me on the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate Bootcamp. While we're there, please sign up for the free book that's going to go with that bootcamp or come around before or after that bootcamp. I'm passing the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate and Professional course. Sign up for the AWS Advanced Networking course. Again, completely free. 
and it'll be the AWS Advanced Networking Plus, which you really need to know that's not covered in that course. So I'll do that again completely free. Subscribe and hit the bell. And if you had a good time, please give us a like. Maybe share our channel and some good words to others so we can help more people. And join us tomorrow night. Business acumen is so critical for all these elite roles. So what do we do? We reached out to two business school professors. One of them is Dr. Cooper Johnson. He's come on the show. People loved him, loved him, loved him. And it's also going to be a Dr. Shelley, a, a, a Dr. Jamie Long, someone that Mr. Professor Johnson taught many years ago, who is now teaching, and she's pretty amazing when I spoke to her too. So join us and learn some business acumen and completely free tomorrow night at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern on the Head in the Cloud show. Look forward to seeing you another time, and please join us for the webinar on Thursday, the How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar. It'll be on Zoom. You can ask me questions in real time, and I'll answer them in real time, full, full conversations, all free. Can't wait to see you. Take care. Get Cloud hired, everybody.